Hey, everybody. John Ann's again with uh, Ashtonwood House Concerts. Happy New Year. I know it's already March, but we have not really spoken uh, much since then. So we, I hope you are doing well. And I hope that you, like we are, are looking forward to our first performance of our 2024 season, our seventh season, uh, which begins on Saturday, April 6th. Um, just a little over a week away, and we will be hosting uh, and presenting the Haley Brunel Trio. So um, we will start with that. We'll bring Haley in, and we'll talk to her a little bit, and um, get uh, get ready for uh, for our launch event for this season. Haley, hi. How are you? Doing well. Can't complain. You? Good. I'm doing well. We're uh, we're all very excited here. It's uh, been a while since we've um, we've had a show at the house, and we are thrilled that um, you and uh, and the guys who we'll talk about later um, are coming up to join us. Yeah, we're excited for a little homecoming trip. That's great. Well, so you know, it it, it has it occurs to me sometimes, and um, that when I'm speaking to some musicians who are coming up. Um, it is sort of a, they have no idea where Sal Hadley is, but um, but this is not going to be um, unusual terrain for you. No, I'm a Western Mass, born and, born and raised. So I guess speaking of, um, tell us, for those that don't know you um, all that well, even though you may have, obviously you've got some um, some local connections, what... Um, Tell us about growing up, you know, the, you know, some of the uh, early influences, what got you into music, um, hopefully um, willingly versus kicking and screaming. And then, you know, from that until, uh, you know, you know, when we, when we logged on. Sure. Oh gosh. It's a long time. I'm older than I used to be. Um, I grew up uh, in Longmeadow, Massachusetts, and my uh, dad was probably my biggest musical influence when I was a kid, uh, Dave Brunel. Um, who actually some might still know as Dave in the morning, the radio show host in Massachusetts. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, he always was uh, playing out, singing and playing piano. We listened to a lot of different jazz records at home and uh, a lot of a lot of Sinatra and Dean Martin, uh, Wayne Newton. I learned a lot of jazz standards from as a kid, believe it or not. Um, but when I was 12, my dad invited me to be part of the act um, and I started singing and playing drums actually at that time with him out different places. We played a lot in Springfield, um, just different places around Western Massachusetts and surrounding areas. Um, started singing and playing trombone with him and then finally went off to college at Temple University in Philadelphia, um, where I learned about many other different musicians and learned from the Philadelphia jazz community. Um, and I have been in the Philadelphia area for the past 10 years. Wow. Okay. So now, so do we, uh, should I assume that, um, or should we assume that you sort of came by um, the trombone because it was put in your hand during, you know, um, you know, middle school band, or did you sort of seek that out some other way yourself? I love telling people this because uh, trombone wasn't my, my first choice. Um, I wanted to play the, the, the French horn because I, I liked all the windy tubes. Uh, <laughs> and then they didn't have one of those at the school when they were doing the instrument demonstration in fourth grade. So I said, okay, I want to play the, the baritone horn because it had the same tubes. Came home and my brother said, no, don't play that. You can't be in jazz band. You should play the trombone. And that's how I picked trombone. I was also, uh, there was some uh, family history. My, my grandfather on my dad's side was a trombonist. So ended up falling falling into a good path with that so wow. thank my brother thank my brother paul okay oh that's great and now would you um were you you don't have to um pick one but um but maybe i'm gonna make you um are you are, are you a singer who also plays trombone are you a trombonist who also sings uh do you do you enjoy both equally and um, and consider yourself, you know, equally adept, or or does it, or does are the lines blurred? Does it is it hard to tell? I could give you an answer, but it would change in an hour. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it totally depends. I mean, I, I feel like that's why I love being, you know, my own my own boss, my own band leader, because I love switching between the two. Um, but you know, I'll be on a on a big band gig playing trombone thinking, oh, you know, I really wish I was in front of the band singing or I'll be, you know, just singing with a trio and think, oh, I wish I had my horn right now. So it depends on the situation, but somewhere in the middle. 
and and it looks like you get a good amount of work doing each. So you know, you just got off um, what a, a three or four nights at Dizzy's where you were mostly playing. Yes, I was playing with Diva Jazz Orchestra run by Sherry Miracle, um, who I've been lucky to play with for the past nine years. I just saw that come up in my Facebook memories. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I usually just play trombone with that band. It's a wonderful big band, but Sherry invited me on this gig to sing a couple songs. So it was nice to be able to do both, but yeah, originally called as a trombone player and then revealed that I was a singer later. Okay. Well, that's great. That's great. Um, so obviously for, for this upcoming gig at, at our place, um, we will not be surprised when you grab the mic. Cause that's, we know that going in. Um, so let's, so went down to Philly for school. And stayed, it sounds yes. like. Okay. Um, and um, who, um, I mean, I know I've, luckily I've gotten to know some of the Philadelphia people and there is obviously a very, very rich sort of jazz community down there. Um, who are the people that you've been playing with down there sort of regularly that, you know, has sort of, you know, been part of your, you know, community the last, you know, uh, well, I guess 10 years. Yeah. Um, well, my current, uh, my current quartet and the quartet I've been recording with. Um, and actually, I can open that to quintet. Uh, three of the players I went to school with, uh, Silas Irvine and Joe Plowman, who you'll meet yeah. um, uh, up in Western Mass, um, as well as my trumpet player, Andrew Carson, who I went to school with and I now live with. Um, <laughs> and uh, my drummer was a huge influence and has been Dan Monahan because he was actually one of my professors um, at school originally. Um, so that's one of the lovely things about, uh, being in music school and staying in the place you went to school is people that were your teachers become your colleagues, um, as yeah. you start developing, um, as a musician. So Dan, uh, had a big hand in, in my development, uh, the guitarist in Philadelphia, Greg Kettinger, um, was one of my biggest mentors out here when I was in school. Um, but yeah, the Philly jazz community has been such a, a home, whether it's, you know, people of my own age that went to Temple, people that have been gigging in Philly for decades or even people younger than me now that are coming up through the, the programs in Philly. It's, it's a really, really great city to be a musician in. Oh, that's great. That's great. And I, I then I also apologize then we just don't have um, a, nearly enough room to put a drum kit in the living room. Um, but, um, um, and we may not have enough sound dampening for that either, but um, uh, next time. Um next time. So, you know, it's funny, I, I'm almost to the point where I want to stop asking this question, but I know it it really, uh, for some people, it was really critical, you know, that, you know, the sort of in the heat of COVID, I've, I've, you know, some people have said, look, if it wasn't for COVID, I wouldn't have done this, I wouldn't have gotten myself into the studio, I wouldn't have written so much, I wouldn't have composed. And so I guess, while I, you know, we certainly are out of the woods, um, you know, it, it was an important time for some. So how did, how did you navigate um, a time of obviously not not doing what you were doing, you know, the week before it hit. Yeah. Um, well, right before uh, right before the pandemic, I had just finished uh, recording my first album. Um, I'm forever blowing bubbles, and I had a whole release plan. I was going to self release. Yeah. Um, and at the beginning of the pandemic, I had put I put out two of the singles from the album, uh, but because I had a lot more time on my hands and I was doing a lot more social media promotion, um, I ended up getting linked up with uh, a record label outside in music based out in New York, uh, run by Alan Blanchard and Nick Finzer, Nick Finzer, who is also a wonderful trombonist. Um, and they really helped me sort of uh, gain some momentum and really dive in in a, a meaningful way to the music industry in a way that I wouldn't have had the time nor energy to do um, pre-COVID. Uh, yeah, I also started checking out a lot, uh, a lot of more diverse, you know, areas of music. I, I listened to a lot of, you know, I listened to primarily jazz pre-pandemic, and then uh, I noticed. Uh, I, I, some of the musicians have talked about this too, you know, somewhere in month five uh, <laughs> of not gigging. Um, Jazz, it almost made me sad to listen to sometimes because I would think about, you know, my gigs I wasn't playing, the people I wasn't playing with. Um, so I started listening to a lot, uh, just other music that I wasn't really performing, um, a lot of like 70s pop, especially. And then when mm. I started thinking about tunes for my second album, Beautiful Tomorrow, 
Um, you'll hear there's a diverse selection of tunes from there. There's a Harry Nilsson tune on there. There's a Donald Fagan tune on there, a Sherman Brothers tune. Okay. So it sort of helped me, you know, get out of just the jazz standards realm. And I have a couple originals on that album that were also, as you said, uh, a product of having a little more time on my hands. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Um, you know, it's funny. I think the first time we hadn't met yet, the first time I was sort of aware of you uh, was sort of in the heat of COVID because a, a good friend of mine, who's also a good friend of of people at Ashtonwood up here, is a guy named Benny Benack, who you probably know. Yeah. Um, and I knew that Benny was going to be on this particular evening as a finalist in the Sarah Vaughn vocal competition. And lo and behold, you're one of the finalists as well. <laughs> so I, how how was that experience? Um, it was unlike anything I had done before. And that, <laughs> again, was something that uh, really was, I was sitting, because I was part of like the the like most COVID Sarah Vaughan competition, who was a <laughs> big empty <laughs> hall. Um, but I, I applied to that kind of as like, a, oh, why not? I, submit, I, I literally just submitted videos that I had already kind of taken that were old. And I was like, oh, I'll just throw these in. Why not? So I was shocked when I was <laughs> selected, which made me very happy. But um, I had never done a, any sort of music competition before. Um, and it was really enlightening to, you know, meet all meet the other finalists, um, go through that whole experience. Um competitions are interesting um <laughs> but the performance part and really interacting with the other musicians was was really rewarding that's great was the was that finalist um portion the only part that was sort of you know live in person or or were were the previous stages also or were they all yeah, submitted uh, by video and stuff yeah everything was a remote video submission and then uh, we did like yeah once the finalists were chosen we started having some in-person things right um so anyway, so let's talk about um, next weekend, um, Saturday night, April 6th. You're here with uh, with Silas and Joe. Um, obviously a smaller ensemble than you sometimes play with, either quartet, quintet, or when you're playing big band, and obviously in a considerably smaller venue. Um, do you like that? Looking forward to it? Claustrophobic? Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no, I, I absolutely love performing in smaller intimate venues and uh, Joe and Silas, uh, we do a lot of trio work too, because they're sort of my uh, arranging uh, buddies, <laughs> for lack of a better phrase. Um, so we're really excited because we don't usually get to just perform because we're actually working on some new arrangements. And so this is going to be sort of our opportunity to debut a couple new things um, that we've been working on collectively to a new audience. Awesome. So we're excited to have that sort of intimate space to sort of test the waters with these new arrangements. Um. So so and speak. I didn't. Is there? Um. I think you've already mentioned you know the sort of things that are are in a a, a set. Is there anything else about this set coming up that would you know that people should either prepare for or would be surprised by? Um. I'm adding more things into my set that are not tr traditional jazz repertoire. Um, and I've actually been taking a lot of influence from uh, musical theater, but not exclusively, you know, great American songbook musical theater, um, you know, Sondheim, Andrew Lloyd Webber, listening to different things. So I've been slowly trying to integrate some of those. So lovers of musical theater, there might be a couple. Uh, I, I there imagine there's. You'll enjoy. Yeah, I expect there's a wide variety of um, of interest uh, in the room. So, um, well, that is great. I I wanted to just ask you because it's um it's obviously it's it's part of who you are. Somewhere I don't know if it was in COVID or 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 just in the last few years, you also had a little bit of an injury that took you sort of literally out of play for a a little while. Um, how is that? Yeah. So uh, about two years ago, I started having some vocal fatigue and hoarseness issues. Um, and this was, again, just getting back into gigging after not gigging for so long. Uh, and found out over the course of, you know, treatments and diagnoses, uh, I had developed a polyp on one of my vocal cords. Um, so it was two years of, you know, figuring out what it was, taking time off singing, taking time even off playing sometimes um, mm. when I was getting treated. Um, and culminating into last August, I had uh, surgery to remove the polyp. 
And my team at uh, Jefferson Hospital here in Philly was absolutely wonderful. I have a great mentor out here, uh, Rosemary Atrowski, who is a great vocal uh, therapist. And I'm now getting back to, since August, all of my, my vocal work. And it's been very difficult, obviously. Um, and, you know, that feeling of almost a loss of identity at times, feeling like I wasn't able to sing, wasn't able to do the thing I had prepared my whole life to do. Um, but on the other side of it, it's been really interesting to explore um, using my voice in different ways because it has changed um, in some ways just because I produce things a little differently now. Um, yeah. And I'm working on singing in a really healthy, sustainable way. So that's actually where the musical theater component uh, made its way in because I started working on a lot of, uh, you know, not belty, but like, you know, classic musical theater repertoire in my uh, voice lessons. And it started sort of sneaking its way into my act as my voice has gotten stronger. So, uh, yeah, excited well, to start unleashing my new voice in the world. Well, obviously, um, good for you. Sorry to uh, that you went through that, but it sounds like you have come out the other side uh, in great shape. Is are those two things um, playing and and singing? You were you were able to still play through much of this, if not all of it, but. Yeah, most of it, except for directly after surgery, because I found out when you play your vocal cords approximate sometimes. Which well, you would think, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I was thankfully able to play um, for, for the majority of my treatment. Wow. Well, that's like I said, that we're, we're just we're thrilled and um, and uh, that you are obviously back in great shape and in great voice. And you've got this great um, uh, trio coming up. Uh so I don't know what else to um, to say. I think we know now at least enough about Haley Brunell to sort of go in there with uh, you know as a as a slightly more educated audience um, <laughs> than we would have uh, before this. So um, so Haley, we um, we wish you well. Oh, and you've actually got a you've got a um, I sort of made a joke about it on Facebook the other day that you know Dizzy's Birdland. Ashton Wood. It's sort of the normal progression for any, you know, any sort yeah. of, you know, uh, <laughs> up and coming uh, jazz star. But so you, but you, you've still got a Birdland gig between uh, between now and when you come up to see us. Uh, yes, that will be on April 1st with, again, with a Sherry Miracle and the Diva Jazz Orchestra and actress Linda Pearl from Happy Days. So I'm very Oh, excited. wow. Yeah, she's the, she's fronting the band. So very excited to meet her and sing, uh, do her music. That one I'm just playing on. Awesome. Well, we are thrilled to have you coming up. I, it sounds like you'll probably also have a, a home cooked meal while you're uh, up this way. Hopefully, one, one or two. I have one some nice <laughs> hosts up in Western Mass. <laughs> That's great. Um, well, thanks again. Um, April sixth, seven p.m. live on Facebook and obviously live in our living room. We can't wait to see you. We can't wait to be there. Thanks, Haley. Yeah. Yeah.